Howdy, folks. So I was watching the TV series The Last of Us recently, and I was settled in for some dystopian post-disaster future, and then I saw it. Two skyscrapers melded into one, or maybe rather, one holding up his buddy, and at this point, I didn't need entertainment, I needed answers. And I'm sure you've seen this trope before, like, you know you're in for a good old apocalypse when the creators bust this one out. It's intimidating, precarious, and absolutely intriguing, so the question comes, how real can that be, or should this more accurately just be a pile of dust on the ground? I mean, from an analytical perspective, there's a limit to this sort of thing, but I want to explore what factors drive those limits. Like, would just a slight lean cause both buildings to topple? Does the building need to be shorter or taller like we see in The Last of Us, Cloverfield, or others? And what else is there? Uh, so let's get going. To start, let's describe the geometry. Uh, one building is standing, one building is leaning. Groundbreaking, I know. Uh, they each have their own height, width, and quite importantly, a space between them. That will dictate what angle the two buildings come together. Next, let's note that there is a force that the leaning building imposes on the straight fella as a result of its weight. Now, before we go too far, I'll say that this is what we would call a rigid body analysis, meaning the two buildings are supposed to act as stiff as possible, as solid blocks, meaning the effect the forces have don't distort the shape of the buildings, because the leaning buildings would want to sag, and the straight one would want to lean as well. But the broad strokes aren't appreciably affected, though we'll come back to this later. So with that out of the way, we can next state that these F forces can be solved by statics, where the F force multiplied by sine theta of the height should be equal to the weight of the building multiplied by this variable A. And you know, you know, I'll tell you what, I don't have a penchant for reading physics equations back out of y'all. I was not a TA in grad school, but if you're interested enough, you can pause the video as you like to follow the details along. In the meantime, I'll try and describe it in plain English. And if this really isn't your thing, watch some subway surfers or something. I, I, I don't know. So anyways, we'll be able to define that dimension A as a function of the geometry, and based on simple trigonometry, force out an estimate for the applied force F as a function of the building weight, width, and space between the buildings, bound again by a few assumptions. I'll jot those up in the corner. So what do we do with that? Well, in order to get our leaning building condition, this force would need to be resisted by the straight building, meaning the force F would need to be less than the lateral design strength, and while we don't know the design for sure, we can estimate it based on what the applied loads would be. And that sort of thing is usually governed by wind or earthquake forces. So I checked the supposed location of the condition using an online tool provided by the American Society for Civil Engineers. And oh, please no earthquakes, please no earthquakes. Woo, okay. Uh, just a 124 mile an hour wind. Uh, still, we can estimate a force on the building based on that max wind speed, which shears and bends the straight building, and thus two collapse conditions could occur due to either shearing or bending, and the relations are as shown. And these conditions can be refined with estimations for unit weight, so ultimately we can define whether or not this geometry should be possible based on height, width, spacing, and wind load. Alright, now I've successfully and somewhat unintentionally embodied my inner Charlie Day and have roughly derived some equations to check whether or not the tower leaning on one another is possible, but something still doesn't sit quite right. For one, there are still several minutes left in this video, but really, it's not like we've ever seen something like this before, right? And, and I don't just mean any leaning buildings, because there are many examples of this phenomena, like the famous tower in Pisa, Italy, or the pair of leaning towers in Bologna, Italy, and even ones that didn't happen in Italy. But in each of these cases, the culprit is typically unequal settlement of the foundation due to variations in soil strength below the structures. And for a more in-depth look at those examples, I suggest Googling it. Okay, but to the point we're trying to make, it's obviously possible for a building with a slight lean to occur. Pisa leans about 4 degrees, and a couple of towers in Germany even exceed those and have each stood for hundreds of years. To port this over to our math from before, that restoring force is zero, since there's no straight building in the way. But that works because the foundation can resist that imbalance even if it does move. Still, there are some select cases, often in the wake of a disaster, where a building really collapsed into another, and it stood. This thin building in Taiwan gave its neighbor a kiss here, that's only about a degree or so of movement. In Turkey, this mid-rise apartment collapsed into its neighbor, suspending each for a time, a, a morbid sight to be frank. 
So jumping quickly to the next example, again a residential building, this time in Egypt, fell across the alley into its neighbor back in 2017. Now luckily no one was hurt, and for our detached consideration it serves as the prime example. There is a significant angle formed between the two structures, and they apparently stayed like this for several weeks until engineers began to carefully deconstruct the precarious building. The damage to each building structure is relatively limited, though I'm unsure of how specifically the building failed at the base to precipitate the toppling. And there are likely to be many other examples, but as these are very precarious cases, documentation can be difficult. And outside of our Egyptian example, few seem to stand. So now it's time for us to get into other factors, because the idealization we performed before obviously doesn't tell the whole story. The first and easiest one to describe would be the impact factor. When a load is applied abruptly, the equivalent static magnitude, like we defined earlier, is amplified greatly by two, five, even ten times. It's, it could be massive. For our case, the impact factor is primarily dependent on the velocity of the collapsing building, but also how stiff the straight building is, which is why I opted to neglect it in the rigid body analysis. So it would certainly be calculable, but a bit more rigorous than any of us signed up for. Uh, broadly speaking though, the greater the angle of motion, the higher velocity and higher impact, which I'm sure is painfully obvious. The next significant factor is to look at the building elements a little closer, because the structure isn't just one big block. Uh, many buildings are framed with discrete elements like columns and beams, which are very efficient at supporting loads coming from specific directions, so it'd be a bit problematic if, say, the force of an entire collapsing building were to be applied on a single column perpendicular to its strong direction. Even if we were to engage all of the columns along the face of the impact, it's still certain to cause failure of the columns, and thus all of the floors above those failing columns to collapse as well. And this is precisely why the buildings in Egypt were able to stay standing. Both appeared to use full building width concrete shear walls combined with their columns that basically treated the buildings like the solid blocks we assumed in our idealized analysis. All right, now, uh, the last factor comes with a bit of an admission. My Charlie Day math from before is a little goofy. The assumed mode of failure in which the building is tipped over like a cow doesn't really make sense. I mean, the math could probably math for the Egyptian solid walled case, but if we're to assume a framed high-rise building with beams, columns, shear walls, or braces, this configuration would require the foundation to rip up from the ground on one side, then all of the way to the building to come down through the columns on the other, meaning these columns would have to be designed by four or ten times to take the vertical loading, not to mention horizontal. It's unlikely, let's say. So the mode of collapse is going to be rather important, and anything that demolishes or removes column elements is likely to cause collapse, before the leaning building even has time to rotate and become supported by the intact building. So taking a page out of the Italian foundation design book, the framed building would need to experience a failure of a shallow foundation of some sort, meaning a foundation that doesn't anchor deep to bedrock. All right, uh, now to snack on the fruits of our labor, let's go back to The Last of Us. And rather than give you a yay or nay on the feasibility, I'd rather describe the best justification I can muster for getting these buildings to appear as seen. And although there are a couple of examples I've floated, I'd like to actually take the one seen in the gameplay rather than the epic looking episode 2 version, in part because I really don't think that one can work with all of the deterioration to column elements, the deep angle, the lack of structure, and the straight building like right below the point of impact, so let's use that first case. So getting into some lore, the damage in the city is said to have been caused by bombing, which is a bit unfortunate considering the thing I said like 30 seconds ago about the building elements remaining intact. However, take this flight of fancy with me, what if the bombing didn't strike this building, but rather exposed and damaged an underground water main, which caused significant flooding into the soils beneath the building, causing erosion and settlement for the building to start to tilt. But I'll be damned if that doesn't just totally mess with the rigid body analysis assumption about the point of rotation from before, because the building wouldn't rotate about the nearest corner, and if we ignore the intermediate steps of the soil bearing capacity slowly seeping away on the leaning side, then we should end up with a rotation more about the opposite corner, 
So I went back and fixed those calcs, but that raises an interesting question about how quickly that erosion occurs, because obviously to reduce the impact factor, we would want it to occur as slowly as possible to gently set those two towers together. However, if the building leans over slowly, it reminds me that another factor may be introduced called the P-delta effect. Basically what this means is that the vertical gravitational loading of a now deflected structure applies not just forces straight down, but also tries to bend the building and while a good lateral design should account for P-delta, there would come a rotation that the P-delta forces induced by the leaning itself would collapse the tilting building before it even gets over to its neighbor. It's really hard to say what the limit of that tilt would be. And so let's assume for the moderate rotation we're expecting that it wouldn't come into play, but I could definitely see an argument otherwise. Anyways, Next, we'd need to make some assumptions about the framing of each building. The ideal scenario would be that the intact building has a core wall system near the point of impact, and similarly for the collapsing building, and this should mitigate the damage to discrete elements like columns. As mentioned before, we'd want to keep as many of those as we can in good shape. And all of these factors would, at a minimum, be required to fall in line just to have the right assumptions to get our second iteration of napkin math to work out. And it became pretty evident that the case with the two very tall towers that touch at the top doesn't even come close to mathing and would need to assume that the intact building be designed for a pretty significant earthquake to resist that much lateral force. Okay, so maybe a bit of a letdown, but to share a case that can be supported, Basically, the leaning building needs to be about half the height, one eighth of the total weight of the intact building, and they'd need to be separated by just an alleyway or so, only a couple of degrees of lean. And that's curious because it's less than many real leaning towers that don't have a crutch to lean on, but the big assumption here is that most of the earth directly below our leaning building is no longer there and provides zero help outside of this one corner. A simple assumption, but one that doesn't really work either, because most realistically, the soil support would look something like this, applying continuous support of varying capacity along the length. Think of a series of springs with varying stiffnesses, something borderline impossible to do by hands. And man, I was trying to keep this simple, not hide behind a fancy model, but to do this at least kind of accurately. So using the trusty analysis tool Risa, we're gonna go with two 600 foot tall towers separated by a small street, so this case here, leans at 7.5 degrees. Instead of applying an 80 million pounds of force that we saw in our rigid body analysis, that number is reduced by one third or so to 25 million pounds, which is still way more than the straight building can be expected to resist, but does start to get into the realm of possibility. Regardless, this isn't to say that the only way for leaning buildings to occur are via these assumptions, chaos is always in play, who's to say that when the leaning building makes impact, it damages and removes columns, but then that load is transferred through the leaning building instead, unlikely and precarious, but not impossible. Though, when considering the precarious nature, we've really only looked at these buildings in a vacuum. That design wind on which we based the strength of the intact building could still happen. So hypothetically, when a wind that applies just a fraction of the maximum occurs, we'd likely see these towers sent to their doom. And in The Last of Us, the events of the bombing happened a couple decades prior and has surely experienced many large storms. But for the sake of optimism, let's say that this has yet to happen and we can preserve this little fantasy a bit longer. So what do you think? Uh, did this video even make sense? Uh, sometimes the questions posed at the beginning end up being way more convoluted than at first glance. Either way, go ahead and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Adios.